Thanks for that. Good morning, church. It's great to be with you. It's been a man. It's been a great morning already. Amen. I'm thankful for our time in worship and for the goodness of our God. And you can be reaching for your Bibles and opening up to Matthew chapter nine. Uh, we are continuing in our, our summer series, uh, which is uh, simple stories, looking at the parables of Jesus. These simple stories, truly, that change everything for us. And that's what brings us to uh, the parables of uh, the. A new patch on an old garment and a new wine in old wineskins, Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 14. You can uh, join me there. We'll, we'll read through it in just a moment. But as you're turning there, I want to I wanna bring to your attention a story that I read uh, this week, a true story of uh, years ago, a man uh, down in the States who owned an eagle. It's kind of cool, right? Owning an eagle. I mean, that's a cool thing to have. And uh, so he owned an eagle, and, and as a tourist attraction... He would keep this thing chained up to a pole. Yeah, oh, I was right. That's tough. That's, that's a little sad. But anyways, what this eagle would do, chained up to a pole, people would come and watch it. All it could do is walk around in a circle around this pole. And for days and days and days and days and months and months, turning into years and years, this eagle walked around the pole. So much so that it wore a rut into the ground as it walked the same circle around the pole day after day after day. And as the eagle got, got older, the man had pity on it and decided that in its old age, he would let it go free so that it no longer was chained to the pole. And so a bunch of people showed up to see the majestic moment when that eagle was set free and it soared away in all of its beauty and majesty. And the man unchained it, he grabbed the bird, and he let it go. But to everyone's surprise, the eagle didn't fly. Awkwardly, it flopped down to the ground, and it turned, and it walked back to the rut that it had walked in day after day, month after month, year over year, completely unaware of the freedom that it was afforded, no longer being chained to this pole. It was stuck in the rut of its old way. And unfortunately, that is the reality for so many people living in our world today. Stuck in the rut of their own sinful way, walking around in the same circle over and over again, which will lead to their death, destruction forever. And unfortunately, it's the same way that many of us, believers in Jesus Christ, are living today. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come. And in our passage this morning, we read that he has come to bring the the new wine of forgiveness and freedom and hope and joy and fulfillment and peace and salvation. And yet those he's speaking to don't get it. Because they, just like the eagle, are stuck in the rut of their old way. This morning we'll see that Jesus' coming changes everything for everyone. Not just those who believe in him, but for all people. Especially for those who see the truth of who he is and what he's come to proclaim. And are humble enough to receive it. So what Jesus wants to bring to us today will truly change everything for you. If you hear and see and believe. Let's turn our attention to the text. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Follow along with me as I read. This is God's word to us this morning. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved." Jesus' coming changes 
everything. And to those who believe in his coming and receive the truth that he offers, he enables transformation. And we'll see three things that result in my life when I truly live like and believe the reality that Jesus coming changes everything for me. First, I can see this, live with joy now and forevermore. Jesus is coming, changes everything for me, and enables me to live with joy now and forevermore. Our passage begins with, with these disciples of John the Baptist coming to Jesus and asking him a question. They say, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? They have a question about fasting, and, and specifically the, the frequency of it. At this point in time, the, the Pharisees, and evidently these disciples of John, fasted twice a week. Mondays and Thursdays. And so, in the context of what's going on here in Matthew chapter 9, we can read earlier that Jesus heals a paralytic man. First, he forgives his sins, which bends the Pharisees way out of shape, and then then he heals him physically. And then we see in the verses after, just before our passage this morning, that Jesus calls Matthew a tax collector, hated by the Jews in that day, because tax collectors stole from their own people, aligned with the Romans. I mean, the the Jews didn't like them at all. Jesus calls one of them to be his disciple. And then not only that, Jesus goes to a house party with Matthew and a bunch of his tax collecting buddies, and they have a feast together. And presumably, very likely, as we can see in this passage, the context here, that meal they were sharing and enjoying together was taking place on one of the days that the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist were fasting. Now, notice here that Jesus is being criticized. Don't miss the fact that while the question is posed by the disciples of John the Baptist toward the disciples of Jesus, they're criticizing him because of this. Note that Jesus is criticized first in verse 10 because of who he's eating with. Verse 10 says, And Jesus reclined at table in the house, and behold, many tax collectors and sinners were were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And then here in, in verse 14, he's criticized for eating at all. And the Pharisees and disciples of John, I mean, they're all out of joint. They're up in arms about all of this. And I think at least in part, this is because, and if Snickers has taught us anything, you're not you when you're hungry, right? I mean, these guys are probably pretty hangry, right? We're fasting, we're starving ourselves. Well, well, you guys are splurging and enjoying all this food. What's up with that? And all joking aside, fasting was a pillar of Jewish religious expression in the first century. And so, It really is noteworthy that Jesus and his disciples were ignoring what was a foundational practice of the day. Now, let me make it clear, fasting is a good thing. This is not Jesus condemning fasting in general. Fasting is a biblical thing. It's prescribed in Scripture. It's prescribed by Jesus and even assumed to happen in the lives of believers by Jesus himself. More on all of that later. But the question here that we need to answer is, why aren't Jesus and his disciples fasting. Look down at how Jesus responds, verse 15. Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? This is no time to mourn or go without, Jesus is saying. I'm here. I'm the bridegroom. It's a wedding. It's time to party. I mean, fasting in this day, it, it, was, a, it was a mournful thing. It was associated with, with brokenheartedness and, and desperation, usually over sinfulness or, or some sort of hardship. Fasting in the Old Testament was something that you did when things weren't going how you wanted them to. But that's not at all the situation for the disciples of Jesus. The long-awaited Messiah had come. And his coming was like the coming of a groom to a wedding. I mean, could you imagine going to a wedding today and not having food? It's preposterous, right? I mean, like like one of the first questions people ask you when they find out that you were at a wedding yesterday or a few days ago was, oh, oh, how beautiful was the bride? Did the groom cry? How was the food, right? Like that's, that's just the way that it always, oh, how about this? Could you imagine getting an invitation to a wedding and the invitation is all like dark and dreary and drab and on it it says, 
please join us in a spirit of brokenheartedness and contrition as a new son-in-law joins our family. All right, like, like, (laughs) no, of course not. Of course not. I mean, maybe for the father of the bride, but, man, we get dressed up at weddings. It's time to party. We celebrate. I mean, in, in the first century, weddings lasted for days, if not a whole week. It's time to celebrate, Jesus is saying, because I'm the groom. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm here. Not only that, in saying this, Jesus is also making a tremendous claim about himself. All throughout the Old Testament, uh, Yahweh, God, he, he pictured himself as a groom for his people, Israel, in verses like Isaiah 62, verse 4, Jeremiah 2, verse 2, Ezekiel 16, verse 8, Hosea 2, verse 19, Zechariah 9. It it was a metaphor, an illustration that God often used for the way that he loves and cares for his people, like a a groom uh, protects and provides for his bride. So did the Lord for his people. Now the Son, God the Son, had come. He was sent from the Father to be the bridegroom for his people, the church. He was the one promised. He was the one they had been waiting for. The one who had come to change everything, to bring light and life and salvation and forgiveness and peace and joy and usher in a new covenant. I mean, this was too wonderful an occasion. This is too glorious a reality that God had come. This is too happy and joyful for fasting. After a thousand years of waiting, he's finally here. The disciples not fasting was evidence of the fact that God was with them. And so, of course, they're going to feast, not fast. But, Jesus goes on, look back down to verse 15. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And then, then they will fast. This is one of the the earliest references in the Gospels to Jesus talking about his coming crucifixion. Although although the the present time that they were in, as Jesus was speaking here, was a time for celebration, a time was coming when fasting would be appropriate. Jesus would be crucified, would rise from the dead on the third day in glorious resurrection, and then he would ascend into heaven And it's then that they will fast in anticipation of his second return. That's why we see the disciples of Jesus fasting all throughout the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 14. Jesus is saying here in Matthew 9, right now is not the time for fasting, but I'm not going to be here forever. I will go back to my Father. And when I do, then you will fast. And friends, that's the time that we live in here today. Following Jesus brings a a lifetime of joy. That's very clear. We, We live in the here and now as followers of Jesus, those who have received by grace through faith forgiveness in the the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in our place for our sins. And we live with the, the mandate on our lives, as Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 28, verse 19, that we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's our mission. That's our purpose. That's our goal. That's the entirety of our lives right here as believers. And we can do so with joy, no matter what, because of the great promise that Jesus puts on the end of the mission statement for the lives of all followers of Jesus, which is, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we, when we receive forgiveness and salvation by grace through faith, we receive the presence of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who is in us always, and that's where our joy is found. In the easy times, the simple times, and in the hard and challenging times. We can live with joy no matter what because we have the presence of Jesus. Always. 
but our joy is not yet complete. It's not full in our hearts yet. Why? Because we're homesick. There's an aching and a longing inside all of us. There's, there's an, a, a natural unrest for us as Christians, even with the, the incredible grace-filled work of Jesus Christ alive in us through the Holy Spirit, because Jesus is not with us as, as intimately, as, as physically, as gloriously as we want him to be and as he will be one day. Because we live in, in, in what's been called, and we've used around here before, we live in the, the now but not yet realities of our faith. The, the now is that we live in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, the king has come, his work is complete, we are his bride, his people, and all, and we have all the blessings and benefits that come with that. The payment has been made for us. At the same time, we live in the not yet of all of the fulfilling of all of the promises that he has given to us. We know there's more to come. The bridegroom is not with us physically right now, but he will one day. But until then, we live with the effects of sin and the fall of man all around us in burdens and brokenness, in sickness and sorrow, in longing and loss, in fear and frustration. And, and you know that, don't you? You've experienced that this week, haven't you? So what Jesus is referring to here in, in this passage and what we're longing and fasting for in this life is the time when the bridegroom will return and will put an end to all of those effects of sin once and for all. And when we, his bride, will be with him physically forever to behold his glory in the new heavens and the new earth, when we will no longer fast, but we will feast with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19. And we'll enjoy his presence in the fullness of joy forevermore. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul gets at when he says in 2 Corinthians 6.10 that the Christian life is, is characterized by an attitude of sorrowful yet always rejoicing. So we are broken over sin, our sin and the sins of others against us. We're struggling against our flesh. We're, we're hurt by the world and the enemies of the cross of Christ. We're, we're hated, we're opposed, we're persecuted, we're marginalized. And uh, we say at the beginning of, of every service here at Harvest, we are, we're discouraged, we're ignorant, rebellious. But we have a joy that is unshakable in that we have received the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. By grace, through faith, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We have the promise of forgiveness and salvation, the Holy Spirit alive in us, working to bring about the end of sin, growing us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ from one degree of glory to another. And we have the promise that one day we will be with our Savior in glory forever, and that can never be taken away from us. Why? Because of the work that He has done. Joy, true, unshakable delight can be yours now and forevermore through faith in the work of Jesus who came to change everything. As pastor and theologian John Piper once said, what the world needs from the church, from us, is our indomitable joy in Jesus in the midst of suffering and sorrow. That word indomitable means unable to be defeated. Unable to be quenched. Our joy in this life as followers of Jesus, no matter what we face, cannot be defeated, cannot be quenched, 
because the object of our joy, Jesus Christ our Savior, is undefeated. The grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't hold him. He's undefeated. And that's available to you and me today, Christian. That's what the world needs to see in us. Do they see it in you? Do your unbelieving neighbors see it? Family and friends. Do they see your joy in Jesus in every circumstance? This free gift of indomitable joy now and forevermore is available in Him, the one who came to change everything. You see, the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist, they missed it. They were fasting when they should have been feasting. All because they were still attached to their old way of doing things, which led them to miss the work that their Messiah, the one they were longing and fasting for, was doing. Which brings us to the second thing that Jesus changing everything enables. I can, secondly, leave behind my old loyalties. And perhaps I can is not a strong enough word. It has to be, I should, I must leave behind my old loyalties. We talked already about the fact that fasting was a a biblically prescribed practice for the Jewish people. But in the giving of the law, interestingly enough, in the Old Testament, the Lord only required one day of fasting for His people. That was only to be on, on the Day of Atonement. But as you mentioned already, these religious elites in the time of Jesus had made it a practice to fast twice a week out of religious piety. If you were a devout Jew, if God was really going to be pleased with you, you had to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Why? Well, that's just what a good God-fearing Jew does. And, and that's where the confrontation arose here. Because the Jewish believers, these Pharisees and disciples of John, were elevating their traditions to the place of highest authority. Now, now, let me make something clear here as well. Traditions are fine. Traditions are fine. Traditionalism is not. What's the difference? Traditionalism is elevating traditions to the ultimate thing and holding rigidly to them no matter what. It's not okay. And the extra irony in all of this is the fact that it's not just the Pharisees who are questioning Jesus, it's also the disciples of John the Baptist. John, who had been so unashamed and unapologetic of his proclamation of the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. John, who had, when he saw Jesus coming toward him, declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1.29. And yet still, these guys who were followers, disciples of John the Baptist, were still so attached to their old way of doing things that they wouldn't even heed the words of their own teacher. They wouldn't bow the knee to the one that he rightly declared to be the Messiah. And so Jesus, taking what he has said already one step further, uses two parables, two common real-world illustrations that reveal the issue with what these people were doing. First, we see verse 16, putting a new patch on an old garment. Second, verse 17, putting new wine in old wineskins. And both are making the same point. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will not be an add-on to the religion of the day. Amen. Putting a new patch that hasn't shrunk yet, yet on an old, already washed and shrunken garment would make a bigger hole than the patch was meant to fix. When that patch shrinks, it'll tear, it'll rip. Not to mention the fact that it, it, it wouldn't match. Trying to put a new patch on an old garment would destroy both the patch and the garment. And wine in this time was put in wineskins. It was was a a container for uh, the wine to be put in made of of animal skins that had been cleaned. Yes, they cleaned it. Don't worry. Okay, They cleaned it. They sewed it all up. They kept just one hole open. The wine would go in there. And as the the wine was put into the new wineskins, the wine would ferment. It would be poured out. The wineskins would would begin to get dry and, and, and brittle. And so if you tried to put new wine that hadn't yet fermented into old, hardened, brittle, dry wineskins, when that wine ferments, that new wine ferments, it'll burst the skins. And you lose not only the skins, but the wine you put in it. 
what Jesus is saying is, is don't try and patch up an old coat with, uh, with something new. You need a whole new garment. Don't just put new wine in old wineskins. New wine needs whole new wineskins. Business as usual is not going to work, Jesus is saying to these people. You can't just take everything going on in Judaism with its exclusivity and traditionalism and just slap Jesus on and just slap Jesus on. I mean, Jesus had said, now let's make, again, let's make this very clear as well. Jesus is not just doing away with everything that once was old. He says in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Don't think I've tried to just get rid of all that stuff. No, no, no. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He came to be the fulfillment of all the Old Testament pointed to. He didn't come to do away with it. He came to fulfill it and bring about the truth from it into something new. The Mosaic law points to Jesus. Everything from Genesis to Malachi points to Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says in in chapter 10, verse 1, that the laws of the Old Testament, they were a shadow of the good things to come in Jesus. They all point to him as the new and better way. And so just like it did for the Pharisees and disciples of John, these parables act as a warning shot across the bow for us personally and corporately. Personally, too many of us are trying to make patchwork garments out of Jesus. I need purpose in my life. So I'm just going to slap Jesus on. I tried everything else. I mean, I might as well try him. I'm hurt. I'm just going to slap Jesus on there. I'm single. Slap a Jesus patch on. My marriage is broken. Slap a Jesus patch on. I have some bad habits. I wish I could be better. So I'll just sew a little Jesus patch on there. And listen, it doesn't work. That patch is going to tear away and and it's going to make things worse. Why? Jesus is not a patch for your life. He's not some tiny little square just meant to help you feel better. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come for you is everything or he's nothing. Stop trying to patch up an old problem with Jesus. Stop trying to pour the new wine of what Jesus wants to do in your life into the old wineskins of your own personal preferences or perspectives. You can't squeeze Jesus into your molds. You can't say to God, God, I I, I want you to do something awesome. I want you to do something new and great and wonderful, but only this way. Only if you keep everything absolutely the same. It's not going to work. God doesn't work like that. Start over with him and him alone. Let him be your whole life. Let him and his word define you. Let him tell you what your life is about. Submit it all to him. He comes to bring a new covenant, a new way of life. He comes to pour out his spirit into our hearts to bring joy and forgiveness and freedom where once you were enslaved to sin, to make us new when once we were dead. So receive it humbly and wholeheartedly. Let, listen, let God's word encourage you today. Leave behind your sinful, self-centered loyalties and come to Jesus. He's ready to receive you. To remove the guilt and shame of your sin and to make you new. And then corporately, as a church, we're so often tempted to keep things the same because that's just the way we do things around here. Well, maybe started out as, as genuine, heartfelt expressions of worship have, like the Pharisees and disciples of John, turned into unhelpful at best and downright sinful at worst traditionalism. And that's how churches die. But on the flip side, where the culture of the first century religious elite was the old is best, 
Our culture today has so often believed and given into the lie that new is always best. And so many churches and Christians today are looking for, looking for the new thing. They're pandering after the, the new, new wine, which has led people astray into searching for some new revelation that is actually contrary to the complete revelation of God and His Word. So the question is, what are you personally What are we, corporately, holding on to with closed fists that Jesus wants to take away and make new? What is Jesus wanting to bring into your life that you're resisting? The answer has to be, for us as individuals and for us as the church, that we test Every idea, every tradition we keep, every decision we make, every place we go, every philosophy we espouse, every work we accomplish, every ministry we run, every vision item, every song we sing, every partner we engage with, every budget line, every gift we steward, every interaction we have, every meeting we take, every show we watch, every sermon we preach, every book we read, every picture we post, every judgment we render, every ministry we serve, every prayer we pray, every place we go, every person we date, every word spoken over us or to us, every preacher we listen to, every investment, every purchase, every relationship, every waking moment of every day, every word, every thought, every every deed done to us or by us, every motive, every reason for everything, everything in our lives, we test it against the truth of the complete and inspired and inerrant, infallible, living and active word of God. Why? Because why? I'm not done. Why? Because Jesus and his glory and his gospel and his kingdom and his church are ultimate. Not our traditions, not our preferences, not our philosophies, not our traditions, not our our songs or sermons. If anything is contrary to the truth of God's word, we reject it. Are you living like that? Do you know this word enough to even be able to do that? Because the issue with these Pharisees and disciples of John was that their outward obedience in fasting was just ritualistic emptiness. Prideful self-religion, legalistic lethargy. And they missed out on the Messiah because they were too focused on their old loyalties. In everything that we do, we must be centered on Jesus Christ. Which, and and the context of this passage demands we talk about it for a few moments, must include our fasting. When we fast, okay? When we fast, not if, when we don't fast, we are the exception to the rule that has existed from the very beginning in the church of Jesus Christ. When, not if we fast, we are expressing our adoration of Jesus and we are doing so out of a longing for him to come again. Fasting isn't some magic formula that you do to get what you want, okay? God doesn't owe you anything when you give up food for a day or whatever for a week. We're fasting because we want the joy of Christ. When we fast, what we're saying is, God, I hunger for closeness with you more than I hunger for food or whatever else you might be fasting from. Because fasting is not indulging in something for a time or is not indulging in something for a time. And it's the way that we tangibly express, as our point is talking to here, it's the way that we tangibly express the leaving behind of our old loyalties because it puts Jesus on the throne of our hearts, the place that he rightly belongs. Amen? Amen. And on this, by the way, we've put some links in the sermon notes to some helpful articles on fasting. Uh, Use them to help get started in this spiritual discipline if you haven't already. 
Because really, the, the purpose of fasting today, so if you're not doing it, you, you should, is what I'm saying there. The purpose of our fasting today is to continue pursuing Jesus in all that we are and have. It's putting Him at the center of everything that we do, and that's what leads us to our final point this morning. That Jesus is either, either everything for you or He's nothing to you. So leave behind old loyalties and cling to Him to preserve me. Cling to Him to preserve me. Because if you have truly received him, then you will truly cling to him. That's what happens. That's what happens when you receive the, the new life in, that Jesus offers. When you put on him as our, as our new garment. When you, when you put on him as, when you receive his new wine into the, the new wineskins of, of, your, of your new life in him. Then we cling to him. Because so we have been born again. Jesus uses that phrase when he's talking to Nicodemus. You've been born again. You're a new creation. And verse 17 says, but when new wine is put into fresh wineskins, both are preserved. Because the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of his sinless life, his death on the cross, substitutionary atonement for you, the blood he spilled, his body broken that so the, the, receiving the full weight of the wrath of God because of our sin. By faith in him, you can receive his righteousness in the act of justification, declaring us to be righteous in the eyes of God by the work that he has done. When you receive the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ into a heart that the Holy Spirit has quickened to hear and believe, that is strong enough to keep you until the bridegroom returns. Because friends, the, the final great, decisive act in redemption history is complete. And because of what Jesus has accomplished, nothing can be the same ever again. The blood has been shed. The lamb was slain. The punishment of sins has been paid. Death is defeated. The bridegroom has been risen. The spirit is sent. The wine is new. And that's the truth that we must cling to. And nothing else will satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts but to be with him now and forevermore. So cling to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you hear nothing else from me today, let it be this. Cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In everything that you are, in all that you do, in all that you have, cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Know and rest in the promises that your Savior gives to you. Your Savior who says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. John 6, 38. Your Savior who says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Your Savior who says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. John 10, 27 and 28. Your Savior who says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that you may be where I am, John 14, 3, your Savior who says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. These and so many more are the promises of Jesus for those who have received his gospel those who have embraced the truth of who he is and what he's accomplished, those who have confessed their sins and in repentance sought forgiveness and life and who have received it in the one who promises to forgive. Pastor Charles Spurgeon once said, remember, sinner, it is not thy hold of Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. It is not thy joy in Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. 
It is not even thy faith in Christ, though that is the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merits. Jesus changes everything for everyone, whether they know it or not. And he wants to change everything for you. If you will come to him, the bridegroom, the Messiah, the sent one of God, humbly and with hands open to receive into the new wineskin of your new life in him all the goodness and blessing and fulfillment and truth of the new wine he offers. That brings you joy now and forevermore. It enables you to leave behind your old loyalties that in no way are satisfying you and cling to wholeheartedly to him. So my question is for you this morning, believer or unbeliever alike, is Jesus everything for you? So he'll either be everything or he'll be nothing. Could you stand and sing as we will in, this, in, in a few moments? Take the whole world, but give me Jesus. Or are there old loyalties standing in your way? Other things you're clinging to? Are you allowing the struggles of your life to rob you of the joy of your salvation? Leave them behind. Enter into the joy that he has for you today, now, and forevermore. God wants to use the truth of his word, the wisdom, the majesty, the unbelievable beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent to change and transform you. Maybe for you today it is to bring you from death to life. Maybe for you today it is to free you from the addiction that you've been struggling with for far too long. Maybe for you today it is to help you to make the decision that you have been putting off because you've wanted things your own way. The gospel of Jesus Christ, his coming, his work, his mission, his teaching, his life, his death, his burial, his new life and resurrection changes everything. Let it. Stop pursuing your own sovereignty. Stop pursuing your own autonomy. Give it up to him. Allow him to change everything for you until the day you see him face to face. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you for making a way for us sinners, enemies of yours, to receive that which we could never earn on our own. Forgiveness of sin. Life in the name of Jesus Christ. For once there was death. A new identity in him and him alone. Meaning, purpose, joy. Thank you for the work that you accomplished, Jesus, for us. Thank you for making a way for sinners like me to taste and see your goodness in joy now and forever. In promises, sure. In hope, complete. Father, forgive me for clinging to my old way, to continuing to long for and fulfill the desires of my sinful flesh by going back to things that I'm supposed to be dead to, that you died for. Jesus, move and work in this place. Spirit, use your word to truly change and transform. Don't let us leave here today without truly changing for your glory. Help us to cling to you and we pray, Jesus, hold us fast. 
Our love is often cold. Our love is often moving to all sorts of other things but you. Thank you for the promise that you give us, that you will keep us. For those of us who love you and are following you, we echo the words of the man who declared, I believe, help my unbelief. Take the truth of the gospel so deep into our hearts that it changes everything from the inside out, that we may be the light of the world to proclaim the excellencies of the one who saved and sent us, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen.